العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد كتاب الصلاة So after discussing the most important requirement of Salah, which is Tahara, uh, the Musannif Rahimullah Ta'ala is now going to start with Kitab Salah. So what is Salah? Like what is this thing that we call prayer? So if you look at the reality of Salah or its linguistic meaning, it actually means Dua. Right, so for example, in Surah Al Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Was salli alayhim in the salata kasakanullahum. That, O oh Prophet, pray for the believers on their behalf, for your prayers and your dua for them is a source of tranquility. But when we talk about salah in a more legal sense, in fiqh, it actually refers to a set of words and actions, specific words and actions, which start off with a takbir and end with the tasleem. So you start your prayers with Allah and end with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And in between, you have a set of actions and a set of words that you need to say. Now, what is the status of salah in Islam? Well, Prayers can be depending on which types of prayer they are. They have different statuses ranging from faras to nafil. But in essence, uh, salah in itself is an act of Islam. It's mashru. So as far as its farziya is concerned, it's mentioned in Surah Al-Bayyina, verse number five. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَا وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُ الزَّكَاةِ وَذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمَةِ That the believers have not been ordered but to worship Allah sincerely and exclusively and they have been ordered to establish prayers and give zakat. Also in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions فَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةِ That establish prayers and give zakat. More than 86 Places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders Muslimin to actually establish a salah. And as far as the Sunnah is concerned, there are a lot of hadith about this as well. For example, a hadith in both Bukhari and Muslim, Abunya al Islamu ala khams, that Islam is based on five things Shahadatu Allah ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah, the first being Islam. The Iman itself, wa iqam is salah, ita is zakah, saum in Ramadan, hajj al bayt, mal istata ilahi sabila. And then establishing prayers is another pillar, giving zakat is the third, fasting Ramadan is the fourth, and performing hajj for whoever finds the means is the fifth pillar. Right? And from the day of its conception till our day to day, uh, the Muslimin all over the world. There's an ijma on the farziya of salah, that the salah is uh, something that has legal acceptance in Islam. Now, it's one of the greatest faraiz of Islam, one of the greatest obligations of Islam. Right, like the hadith of Jabir in Muslim, uh, that between a person and kufr is leaving the salah. So you can guess by this uh, the ahamiyah and the importance that salah holds within Islam. And even if it was just an act of ibadah, just an order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were supposed to fill. That would have been enough, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his mercy through this salah benefits the mu'mineen with all types of fawaid, both in relation to their deen and in relation to their dunya.
So amongst uh, the fawaid ad diniyya the religious benefits a person can gain from praying. Uh, so first of all, it's the best way to build a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So you build your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get a, a feeling of appreciation for all of the blessings that he has given you. Uh, you become more aware of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with you. He's with you wherever you are. And also it's a sure way. Uh, it's a sure path to success. Right, the Muslim when he says in the Adhan, Hayya al salah Hayya al fala that come to prayer, come to success. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when mentioning the qualities of the people who will be successful, so he mentions قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَوْشِعُونَ That those believers who will be successful, the first quality that they have is هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَوْشِعُونَ That in their prayer, they have the khushu. They have the mindfulness of what they're doing. They know in whose majesty that they're standing. So salah is actually the gateway to success. And also uh, it is a source of removing a person's wrongdoings and their sins. So the Prophet he said, As-salawat al-khams wal jumwa ila al-jumwa kafaratun lima baynahun ma lam tukhsh al If a person, they avoid the major sins, then from one Jummah to another, if someone is praying all of their prayers, then this automatically uh, deletes and removes all of their other mistakes. Other than that, the Salah also has special properties in Preventing someone from actually doing the wrong things, preventing them from sinning. That really prayers have the strength to stop you from committing ill and evil deeds. Now, sometimes a question has risen that uh, rises that I do pray, but I don't see myself stopping from evil deeds. A lot of time people don't have the intention of stopping themselves. Or they don't have this intention that the Salah will help them. So your intention actually matters a lot. In the Hadith it's mentioned that Ana inda abdi bi, That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I deal with my Abd, I deal with my slave as he expects of me. So if you actually accept, expect that the Salah will stop you, then it will have the influence. But if you have no intention, it might not have any influence whatsoever. The other reason is that Salah has an effect, but it's not the complete absolute cause to it. So there are other things that you have to keep in mind in order to achieve this blessing of not being not sitting. Which amongst other includes an effort by a person's behalf in order to prevent themselves from actually falling into sin. So these were some of the religious benefits that a person can attain from actually practicing Salah. Uh, the other one is probably mentioned Surah Al-Baqarah وَاسْتَعِينُ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا الْخَاشِعِينَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually telling us to uh, take help from Sabr and Salah. Meaning that Salah can all be a solution to a lot of our problems and not just religious, even our worldly problems as well. Like the Sahaba عنهم, they became really happy that we got now a direct way of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and in we've got a direct link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to solve all of our problems that included not only their religious problems but also their worldly problems as well and salah also has a lot of social benefits as well so so you'd see a lot of class differences uh, between people in normal day lives but when it's the time of salah and everyone gathers for the jama'ah uh, those differences uh, they vanish no matter what your occupation is no matter which race you're from what your age is where you live none of it matters everybody stands in the same masjid in the same row so it actually helps uh remember in the remembrance and realization of that we're one single ummah right and we're all the same in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the only difference that people can have between them in terms of their status in the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically with taqwa and nothing else, right? It also provides a platform where people meet <laughs> and where can, people can discuss uh, the issues that they're facing in terms of practice, in terms of religion, in terms of outside influences on the society, the Muslim society, on their children, and so on and so forth. So a lot of social benefits are also there in establishing pairs. Now we know that Salah is a farziya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but what is the hukum of the person who actually leaves Salah, who forgoes Salah? So obviously rejecting Salah as being a farz as part of Islam, and that's something that everybody agrees upon, that it's kufr. Because once you know that more than 86 verses of the Quran are telling you to establish prayers, are directly ordering Muslims to establish prayers, you know that this is something that is false. You cannot uh, reject it and still claim to be Muslim. That's like rejecting 86 verses of the Quran. Right? So rejecting it's out of the question, but then the question is, what is the hukum of the person who leaves salah taqasulan wa tahawulan out of laziness just because of that and not feeling up to it, so I'm not going to pray. What could be the hukum of such a person? Right? So as far as the punishment involved in the day of Qiyamah is concerned, it's mentioned Surah Al-Muddathir, that people are, the Ahlul Jahannam, people in Hellfire, are going to ask each other, Ma salakum fi saqar? What is the thing that dragged you into Hellfire? And one of the things they're going to mention is, lam min al that we weren't amongst those who prayed, which means that leaving out prayers can actually lead to punishment in the hereafter. Also in Surah Al-Ma'un, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ مَعَنْ سَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ And woe to those worshippers who from their prayers, who from their salah uh, are negligent, who neglect their salah, either they don't pray it altogether, or they prayed in such a fashion that they're unaware of how many units they're praying, what they're actually praying in it. So vote for such people. And it's mentioned in the hadith, Man salata muta'amidan faqad bari'at minhu dhimmatullahi wa rasooli. That whoever leaves the prayer on purpose, then the dhimmatullah and the dhimmatu rasulillah no longer applies to that person. The dhimma or the promise of Allah, the promise of Allah of relieving him of the hardships of this world and granting him Jannah and protecting hellfire. So all these promises that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does to the Muslimi, 
for one who leaves Salah on purpose, he is not part of those promises. He doesn't get that. So these were all the things related to the Akhirah. But what about the hukum for the one who leaves Salah on purpose in the dunya? The most lightest madhab or the most a convenient mazhab in this regard would be in the Hanafi fiqh, in which a person who on purpose, if they leave Salah, uh, is considered to be a sinner. And the most that could happen is uh, if there is a Muslim ruler there, Ta'adiban, in order to actually make him realize uh, he can put him in jail for some time. Or maybe even a few floggings in order to just make him realize. Other than that, uh, other Ayma, for example, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, uh, they actually say that leaving Salah on purpose, not rejecting it, is actually kufr. And some of the Ayma, they suggest that even though it's not kufr, but such a person uh, can even be put to death. The punishment for leaving Salah on purpose is such great. Not kufr, but haddan. Just like if a person, uh, they committed murder, qisasan, they can be put to death. Uh, the same punishment can be given to uh, the one who leaves Salah. Uh, so you can imagine the status of Salah in the eyes of these Aymah and in the eye of Nabi alayhi salatu salam when he said that, I wish to make someone else the prayer leader for a moment. Then go to the people who on purpose don't join the prayer and burn down their houses on them. Right, so the Ahmi of Salah uh, is so great in the deen. Now let's talk about Kitab al-Salah within the context of the book. Now I mentioned that one of the conditions in order for a person to pray Salah is Tahara, which has already been discussed in Kitab al-Tahara in detail. Uh, Imam Quduri starts off Kitab al-Salah with the chapter of the timings of prayer, which is also another condition for the Salah to be valid. Because if you pray, even um, start praying a minute before the time enters or a minute after the time exits, that prayer will be invalid. You have to do it within the time frame. So what are the times in which a person can actually pray Salah? So he calls, أول وقت الفجر إذا طلع الفجر الثاني وهو البياز المعترس في الأفق so the beginning of the time of Fajr is when the second Fajr rises. And what is the second Fajr? It is the whiteness that spreads across the horizon. So what happens is when it's time of dawn, uh, first there is a beam of light that shoots upwards. Like it shoots upwards vertically. Then after a few moments, that light vanishes. And then a few moments after, uh, the light across the horizon starts to rise, like a wall. So this spreading light, this spreading whiteness, this wall of light which rises, that is the actual time for Fajr, and not the beam of light that shoot up, shoots up in the sky. That's known as Fajr al-Awwal or Al Fajr al Tadib, the deceitful Fajr. So that's not when Fajr starts. Uh, it's hard to observe this in the city because of all of the lights and buildings you usually can't see. But if you've ever camped out overnight, you might have observed this uh, the difference in the two Fajrs. 
and obviously uh, with the apps and calendars that we have, we might not always require these things, but it's good to know because in some situations you might not be able to access technology. So knowing this can help in determining it, especially if uh, you're an avid traveler, a camper, a hiker and stuff like that. So that's when Fajr starts. It starts with Al-Fajr al-Thani. وَآخِرْ وَقْتِهَا مَا لَمْ الشَّمْسِ And the end time is when the sun starts rising. The second the sun starts rising, that's when Fajr ends. وَأَوَّلُ وَقْتِ الظُّهَرْ إِذَا زَالَكِ الشَّمْسِ وَآخِرُ وَقْتِهَا عِنْدَ أَبِي حَنِيفَةً رَحْمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِذَا صَارَ ذِلُّ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مِثْلِهِ سِوَى فَيِّ الزَّوَالِ وقال أبو يوسف ومحمد رحمه الله تعالى إذا صار ذل كل شيء مثله The start of Zohar that's pretty much agreed upon uh, that is in the Zawal أي when the sun starts to decline but the end time of Zohar that is where the Fuqaha have differed in opinion And according to Imam Abu Hanifa, Taala, Zohar ends and then Asr starts. Uh, when the shadow of everything becomes twice its size, except for the Fay Uddawal, uh, that's the shadow of midday. What is this shadow of midday that we're talking about? So what happens is, is when the sun starts rising, Uh, the shadow of something uh, starts decreasing. Like when it, the sun is at one end of the its orbit, the light that it puts on an object uh, leaves a very large shadow. But as the sun starts to come up, uh, the shadow starts decreasing. And until at midday, there's a point where the shadow stops moving, it's no longer decreasing. So at that very moment, uh, this is known as Zawal, Zenith, or Midday, and the size of the shadow, that's considered as Fayu Zawal, the shade at Midday, which neither increases or decreases. Right? And then the sun starts to decline. Then the shadow starts to increase in the opposite direction. So whenever the shadow of an object doubles its size, except for the fay or zawal, because that's something that must be subtracted from it, then Zohar ends. What I mean is, for example, go to a plane uh, where the ground is actually flat. There are no ups and downs over there. Take a four inch stick and place it vertically inside the ground that it's straight it shouldn't be bending on either sides right and when you see observe its shadow from dusk it will start decreasing as the sun comes up and when it's midday you'll see that that shadow stops decreasing right note the size of that shadow let's take an example for example from that four inch stick there's only a half inch shadow that remains on midday which is not moving anymore so half inch would be your fight with Zawal. now when the sun starts declining and the shadow turns eight and a half inch because you know imam buhanifa says when the shadow becomes twice the size of anything so you had a four inch stick, which meant that the shadow must be at least eight inches. So when the shadow becomes the length eight inches, other than Fayuzawal, which was half an inch, so you have to add that half an inch at the end of it. That would mean 8.5 inches. When the shadow of that stick turns into 8.5 inches, then according to Imam Hanifa, 
Zohar ends and Asr starts. But according to his students and the other Aima, when the shadow of something turns the same size, except for the shade of midday, which means for them four and a half inches is when Zohar ends and Asr starts. Uh, the beginning of Asr is when Zohar expires, according to each of the statements just made. But it's end time. That's agreed upon. It's when the sun has not yet set. As soon as the sun starts to set, uh, Asr ends officially. And Maghrib begins when the sun has set. And its last time, its end time is until the Shafaq or twilight has not departed. What is this twilight? It is the whiteness that is seen in the horizon after the redness. So when the sun sets, you actually see in the sky a red light, kind of red shade. Then after that red shade, there comes a white shade. Which also soon vanishes. So Imam Hanifa says that the Shafaq is this white after the red. So when this white twilight also vanishes, that's when the Isha will start and Maghrib will end. But according to the other Aima, including his students, Abu Yusuf for Muhammad, they say that the Shafaq is the redness in the sky. What it means is that according to Imam Abu Hanifa, the length of Maghrib, the time of Maghrib is more than the other Aima. The same goes for Asr, for Asr, for him, the time is lengthier than that, according to the other aim. Not as a sorry, Zohar. But obviously, in both cases, in both Zohar and Asr and in Maghrib and Isha, the safest thing to do uh, is to finish your Zohar in the time of the other aim. But start your Asr in the time proposed by Imam Abu Hanifa Ta'ala. Because both these timings will be agreed upon by both of the opinions. Like if you end it before the shadow of something turns the same size. Imam Abu Hanifa says that your Zuhr is acceptable. And that's necessary according to the other Ayma. So you're safe according to both of them. But you should start your Asr prayer after the shadow turns twice the size of anything. Because that is the time. When according to Imam Hanifa, Asr officially starts before that you can't pray. And the other I'm not for them Asr had already started. So that would be a time when both of them would agree that your Asr is acceptable. And the same thing you're supposed to do in Maghrib and Aisha. So you should end your Maghrib before the redness in the sky vanishes, but you should not commence with your Isha prayer uh, before the whiteness also disappears. Because in that case, you'll be safe according to both opinions. Yes. The beginning of Isha is when the twilight departs, depending on which tafsir of the twilight you're taking, if it's the red piss or it's the whiteness. And it remains until the Fajr of Thani uh, starts to appear. And we've discussed Fajr al Thani, Al Bayad al Mu'taris, Fil Ufuq. It's the whiteness that spreads across the horizon. And wither starts 
with the Isha, وآخر وقتها ما لم يطلع الفجر. And its end time is the same as Isha, that is until the time of Fajr starts. Now these were the start and end times of each prayers, but each of these prayers also has a recommended time to it, a mustahab time, which we call. What are those mustahab times? <laughs> It is recommended to brighten the Fajr, which means to delay it. So that more people can join the Salah of Fajr. It's mentioned the Hadith, Asfiru bil Fajr, Fahimnu Ajr. That brighten the Fajr, delay it so that the light of the sun is more apparent. Fahimnu A'adhamu Ajr, because it is a source of more virtue. Because the more people, the more you delay it, the more people are able to join. The more people are able to join the congregation, the larger the congregation, and so the larger the virtue. But if you're in a place, for example, the Haramain, in which the Aada is to actually pray it in Ghalas, in the night time, like they pray just as the time enters, right? And people are aware of that, and so they try to join the congregation at that time. So in the Haramain, for example, or in those countries or areas where there's a habit amongst the people of actually praying Fajr early, then you should pray Fajr early. That would be the recommended time. So basically you want to get as many people as you can to join the congregation in order to determine in order to determine the fadlila or the istihbab of any time. So that's for Fajr. Wal ibradu bil dhuhri fi saif wa taqdimuha fi shita. To cool zuhr in the summer, that is to delay it. So the sun can come down as much as it can. But that is in the summer. And in the winter, you should uh, actually try to Pray Zohar earlier so that you can get it in the first prayer, first time as quick as possible. Uh, in coastal areas where the temperature is uh, fairly constant, there is some difference in obviously in summers and winters, but it's not a drastic change as you'd usually get in other areas. So, for example, in a lot of coastal areas, Zohar remains constant. They usually don't change it between uh, summers and winters, and so that's also acceptable. And to delay the Asr prayer as long as the sun does not change. Like 20, 25 minutes before Maghrib, uh, the sun starts to change. What it means the sun starts to change is that you can directly look towards the sun without actually uh, being forced to close your eyes. So you can directly stare at the sun and it won't hurt your eyes. That's considered as the makru waqt, to which you should not delay your asr. So you should be praying your asr before that time. That is in normal circumstances, but if it's a cloudy day, then it's better to actually uh, pray asr quickly and not to delay it. Because, because if it's cloudy, you, can, you can't see the sun. So it might be difficult to determine when the sun will actually change its color or its intensity. So in order to avoid entering that time frame, uh, in a cloudy day, a person should pray the rasa uh, earlier. And to pray Maghrib quickly, that's also recommended. But then again, in cloudy days, you should delay it a little because it's possible that someone might make a mistake in their determination. It'll be still time for Asr 
and they'll be thinking it's Maghrib. So just to make sure, you should delay Maghrib in a cloudy day. By normal days, you should try to pray Maghrib as soon as the sun sets. Uh, and Isha should be delayed up till just before one third of the night. And that is if it's not a problem. If it's like a problem and people want to pray Isha really quickly, especially in the mountain ranges in those areas, uh, people usually pray Isha just as the time enters because they need to go to sleep early. So in that case, they don't need to delay it, but if you can, then delay Isha up till one third of the night. And what about with the prayer? We know that it starts with the Isha. Like what is the most time for with uh, For a person who's accustomed to performing the tahajjud, the night prayer, for him it's best to delay uh, vitr till the very end. I mean, if possible, make vitr your end salah, your last salah. But for a person lam bil intibah, that who's not sure or confident if they're going to wake up for tahajjud, so they should pray vitr. Uh, before sleeping. And these instructions, both of them, have been given by the Prophet Islam to different Sahaba, to some who he knew could easily get up in the night. He recommended that you should make with her your last prayer, which was also the habit of the Prophet Islam himself. But for those Sahaba who he thought might have difficulty in waking up for the Hajj, uh, for them, he recommended that you should pray with them before you go to sleep. So it depends on the kind of person that you are, like people are different. And so the Sharia, uh, it facilitates everybody. And so these were the times of prayer. Uh, there are start and end times and the mustahab times as well. And so obviously, uh, the sunnah connected with each prayer should be prayed within the same time frame. Just like the farz needs to be prayed in its specific time, the sunnah related to that farz must also be performed in those specific times. And the nawafil, there's no specific time for that. Uh, you can pray them any kind of nawafil in any of those time slots, except for their five times, which are considered as makruh. Al-Awqat al uh, forbidden or disliked times of prayer. Uh, because uh, Imam Quduri has a separate chapter on these makru times, he hasn't discussed them uh, over here. And they'll come into a separate chapter and we'll discuss them when the time arrives. <laughs> Babul Adhan. Adhan linguistically refers to al i'lam, which is to uh, give news or to convey a message. In Surah Al Tawbah, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala mentions wa adhanu min Allahi wa Rasuli that deliver the message from Allah and His Prophet. Uh, but legally speaking, Adhan refers to al-i'lam, uh, giving news to people within specific time frame uh, using special words. Right. Uh, adhan is actually sunnah muakkada. It's not a condition of prayer, which means that if someone prays without giving the adhan, or if someone prays 
when the time enters, but the Adhan is you know, not has still yet to be uh, performed. Their prayers are still valid. They're acceptable. Uh, it's Sunnah Muqqada in the sense, and if a community refuses to actually give Adhan, right? Uh, the Muslim leader, the Imam, he can take up arms to force them to do that. So it's not just any other Sunnah Muqqada, it's also one of the Sha'ir al-Islam, one of those distinguishing features of Islam through which a Muslim community or population can be uh, characterized or determined or seen from afar. Right, so it's Sunnah Muqqada and not just that, it's also uh, one of the Sha'ir Allah, one of the symbols of Islam and the symbols of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the first question for what prayers is Adhan supposed to be performed? Adhan is Sunnah for the five daily first prayers and for the Jum'ah prayer. Uh, not for others' prayers beside that. So you don't give special adhans for sunnah or nafil prayers. Which should tell you that there is no adhan for the tahajjud. There is also no adhan for the coronavirus. I mentioned this because in Pakistan during the, the pandemic lockdown, uh, some people, they developed this habit of giving adhan at 10 o'clock in the night after Isha was done way before Fajr. I don't know for what reason, but they used to give up the Adhan. So the Adhan is not legally justified except for these five daily prayers and for the Jummah prayer. Giving the Adhan on loudspeakers like this uh, is something that's not known to Islam and it might take on the form of a bid'ah. And so such things should be avoided. Uh, another place where Adhan is given is at the time of childbirth. So you give the Adhan in the right ear of the newborn baby and the Iqam in the left ear. So these are the places where the Adhan is acceptable. It's mashru. Other than that, a person should not be giving the Adhan without any reason. And so what is the Adhan? Uh, you know the words to it. That is to say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So you have Allahu Akbar four times. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. You have the Tashahud two times. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So you say both the hawqala, which is hayal al salah, twice. Right? Wala tarji'afihi, and there's no modulation in it. Uh, what we mean by that is according to some of the ayma, for example, Imam Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala, they say that you say hayal al salah four times and you say hayal al-fala four times so first tarji means to actually raise your voice so what happens is he says that first you say hayal al-sala twice loudly and then you say hayal al-sala twice uh, silently and the same goes for hayal al-fala so according to him you do tarji so that makes it in a total of eight times but according to other ayma, including Imam Abu Hanifa, he says that you only do it four times. There's no tarji in it. Just like the normal adhan, like the other words of the adhan, uh, you give it, uh, you perform it the same way. And then after the hayal al-salah and hayal al-fala, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. That's the entire adhan. Uh, except for in Fajr, وَيَزِيدُ فِي أَذَانِ الْفَجْرِ بَعْدِ الْفَلَةِ In Salat al-Fajr, after the Muaddin says, Hayyal al-Fala, he adds these two words, As-Salatu khayrun min al-Nawm. 
uh, that the prayer is better than sleep. He says it twice. This is only in Fajr, uh, not in any other salah. Right? Uh, what is the reply to the Adhan? Uh, the reply to the Adhan is to actually repeat exactly what the Muaddin is saying. Except when he says, Hayal al Salah and Hayal al Fala, but you say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. And when he says in Fajr, as salatu khayrun min al then you should say, Sadaqta wa bararta wa bil haqqi nataqta. Sadaqta, uh, you said the truth. Bararta, you did a good deed. Wa bil haqqi nataqta, and with what is haqq, what is true, you have spoken. So these are the replies that are mentioned within different hadith. Uh, the iqama is the same as the adhan. So the iqama is the call for prayer done just before the congregation starts. So the words are almost the same, except you add two words <coughs> or one sentence twice other than the adhan. So in the iqama, when you say hayal al-fala twice, after that you would say qad qamat al-salah twice. Right? And the answer to the qad qamat al-salah is aqamaha allahu wa adamaha that Allah established this prayer and prolong it in terms of its ajr and in terms of its benefits, etc. So that's how the iqama will begin. And the same as the adhan, uh, except a few adding at qamat al salah twice. And remember, in Fajr Adhan, you increase the words as salatu khayru min al but these words will not be increased in the iqama of the Fajr. They're only for the Adhan. That's number one. Uh, that's the similarities between Adhan and iqama. The one difference is that in iqama, you add the words at qamat al salah twice. The other difference between the two is. وَيَتَرَسَّلُ فِي الْأَذَانِ وَيَحْضُرُ فِي الْإِقَامَةِ That in the Adhan, you take your time, you do it leisurely. Maybe lengthening uh, the time it takes to complete your sentence. But in Iqama, you do it rapidly. You don't stop. So you've probably noticed the difference. I mean, we do act upon it. Another similarity, that in both cases, the person giving the Adhan al Qama should be facing the Qibla. And when they reach the words Hayya al Salah, they should turn towards the right, their face, shifted towards the right. And when they say Hayya al Fala, uh, they should shift their face towards the left in both Adhan and the Qama. Right, and if you've ever went to an Arab country, maybe even in Australia, you might have seen someone uh, performing Adhan or Iqam in a different way. Maybe they didn't say Qad Qam with the Salah twice, maybe they just said it once. Maybe they said Allahu Akbar only twice, not four times in the beginning. And if you have observed it, uh, it's okay. That is also an acceptable method. So in the Hadith of the Prophet Islam, uh, there are different methods that have been proven by Sunnah in order to give the Adhan and the Qam. So like in Adhan the Tarji, that's also by Sunnah and not doing Tarji, that's also by Sunnah. In Iqama, saying the words four times, two times, that's also Sunnah, saying it only once, once, and that's also part of the Sunnah. So whichever you do, that would be sunnah. So there's no need to actually say, uh, discriminate between the two things or to say that one is better than the other. Because some people, when they're unaware, they usually study only one method according to the fit that they follow. And they start to think that the others might be doing it wrong. But that's not the case. The other I know suggested some other way of performing the Adhan the Qama did so uh, for the simple reason that those methods are also proven by Sunnah. Now, obviously, for the time 
<clears throat> if it's the prayer time, you give Adhan. But what if uh, someone misses a prayer? So if, for example, I couldn't pray Zohar at that time, uh, should I be giving the Adhan for my missed prayer or not? It's acceptable. You can give Adhan for missed prayer and also say the Iqamah. And for example, if someone misses more than one Salah, let's say three Salah for some reason, if someone misses more than one prayer, for the first prayer, he will say the Adhan and the Iqamah. And for the other missed prayers, for the second or the third, he has an option. If he wants, he can give the Azan once again and say the Iqamah. And if he wants, and then he can even restrict him or herself to the Iqamah. There's no need to say the Adhan a second time. This is especially for congregation. If a person is praying individually, uh, you have all the right not to give the Adhan as well. It's good if you do, but if you don't, it's pretty much okay. And what should a person take care of when giving the Adhan or Iqamah? When giving the Adhan or Iqamah, a person ought to be in a state of purity. If someone gives the Adhan without wudu, it's acceptable. But shouldn't do that. But it's actually disapproved to give iqama when you're not in a state of wudu. Because iqama is telling you that this prayer is starting and the person giving the iqama himself is not ready for prayer. So this is unacceptable. Similarly, it's makru, uh, highly disapproved. To say the adhan when a person is in the state of janaba, in a state of major impurity. Uh, one should not call for prayer prior to its entry because the adhan is to tell you that the time of prayer has started. If you give it before the time, you're actually misleading people, so you can't do that. But according to Imam Yusuf, for Fajr, you can give it half an hour before Fajr starts so people can get up from their sleep and prepare for Salah, but the fatwa is on Imam Hanifa's opinion that no, not even in Fajr can you give the Adhan uh, before the time enters.